Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the American College of Sports Medicine and the Soy Foods Association of North America, welcome to today's webinar. Mm -hmm. A few housekeeping things before we get started. We'll try to get to any questions you may have at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, please type it into the question area within the GoToMeeting navigation, and we'll get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If we are unable to answer your question during the webinar, we hope to post a blog to the ACSM certification website with all answers to the questions that were submitted. One continuing education credit, or CEC, will be emailed to all participants on the live version, and a link to a recorded version of today's webinar will also be included in that email. You should receive the CEC email and the link within the next three or four days. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our ACSM moderator, Dr. Enette Larson-Meyer, Associate Professor and Director of Nutrition and Exercise Laboratory at the University of Wyoming. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Enette Larson-Meyer, and on behalf of the American College of Sports Medicine, I want to welcome you to this webinar entitled, Challenges for Providing Protein for the Aging to Support Nutrition and Health Needs. Our co-sponsors today, the American College of Sports Medicine and Soy Foods Association of North America have a strong relationship that is built on providing the best and most useful information to individuals participating in nutrition, exercise, and training programs. The ACSM is the largest sports medicine and exercise science organization in the world. With more than 50,000 members and certified professionals worldwide, ACSM is dedicated to advancing and integrating scientific research to provide educational and practical applications of exercise science and sports medicine. The Soy Foods Association of North America is the trusted source for all things soy. The organization promotes the benefits of soy-based foods while encouraging the sustainability and integrity of the soy foods industry. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Rachel Deer. Rachel is a research fellow at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. She is also an associate scholar of the Claude D. Pepper OAIC in the Seeley Center on Aging at UT Medical Branch. Currently, she is overseeing four studies on the acute care for elders unit at Jeannie Seeley Hospital. In this role, she manages clinical trials using intervention strategies to accelerate recovery and improve health outcomes among older hospitalized patients. She's also interested in determining the prevalence and roles of malnutrition and sarcopenia during hospitalization in geriatric patients. It is with great pleasure that I present to you Dr. Rachel Deer. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson Meyer, for the kind introduction. I'm sure that many of you listening in on this webinar are aware of the importance of protein in maintaining health and function, and many of you will be familiar with some of the research that I will be presenting today. However, research is often done in a sort of bubble, where we have healthy younger and older adults that we specifically choose with tight BMIs, no other health problems, controlled diets, etc. And what I hope to provide in this webinar is a translation of what we've learned in the lab into the real world. The real world is messy and fraught with problems and challenges. And what I hope you take from this webinar is thoughts on how we can take all the lessons we've learned from the research that has been done and apply it to the population that needs it the most. So the outline for today's talk will be, first I'll talk about the rapidly expanding aging population. Then I'll talk about how we can best optimize protein intake. I'll talk about some of the reasons for poor nutrition providing some suggestions for the common problems that older adults face. And finally, I'll talk about a few clinical considerations and how protein can provide support during the aging process. So we all know that the older population is expanding. You don't need to be able to read the small print in this image to recognize that across the globe, the color is darkening as we move from 2015 to 2050, indicating a higher population. In 2015, 8.5% of the world's population was 65 and over. This older population of 617 million is projected to increase by an average of 27 million older adults a year. Let me repeat that, 27 million older adults a year 
over the next 35 years, reaching 1.6 billion older adults in 2050. And the older adult population then is expected to represent about 16.7% of our global population. In contrast to the 150% expansion of the population age 65 and older in the next 35 years, the youth population, those under 20, is projected to remain almost flat. And in contrast, children under the age of 5 are expected to continue declining. So for the first time in human history, people age 65 and older will outnumber children age under the age of 5. And this crossing is just around the corner. It's expected to occur before the year 2020. These two age groups will then continue to grow in opposite directions, and by 2050, the proportion of the population 65 and older will be more than double that of children under the age of 5. This unique demographic phenomenon of the crossing is unprecedented. In addition to the rapid expansion of our older adult population, life expectancy has also increased for older adults. In the United States, life expectancy at age 65 has increased from 11.9 years in 1900 to 19.1 years in 2009, an increase in over eight years. So all this is really just to say that our older adult population is rapidly expanding, and we need to take a critical look at how this expanding population differs from younger adults so that we can best meet their needs. As a part of the normal aging process, we all lose muscle and strength. By your, late early, by your late 30s or early 40s, most adults have reached the pinnacle of muscle mass. The degenerative loss of skeletal muscle mass and function occurs at the rate of 1 to 2 percent loss per year after the age of 30 and accelerates with advancing age. The amount of decrease in lean body mass and strength positively predicts falls, fractures, and loss of independence. I think I could bet easily that no one listening in on this webinar has a goal of ending up in a nursing home one day. No, we all hope that we'll be able to live out our lives independently, caring for ourselves at home. Research has shown that optimal nutrition is one way in which we can slow the progression of the loss of muscle mass and strength with advancing age. In this next section, we're going to discuss how we can optimize protein intake. First, we'll start off with a brief review of protein and amino acids. So we all know that protein Dietary protein is important to main he maintain health at any age. Over 40% of the body's protein is found in skeletal muscle. And because there's no active reservoir for protein, it's important that the diet includes adequate protein intake so that muscle stores are not depleted. Dietary protein amino acids, which are the building blocks for protein, are necessary for the body to maintain body composition, bone health, glucose homeostasis, body weight, and overall health and function. There are 20 amino acids which the body uses to make up the thousands of proteins it produces each day. Nine of the 20 amino acids must be consumed in the diet and are considered essential amino acids. They're listed in the table below and include leucine, isoleucine, valine, tryptophan, etc. The other 11 amino acids are not essential, and these can be made from other amino acids in the diet. So normally there's a balance between muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis. So that muscle loss equals muscle gain, and thus muscle mass is at a balance and is maintained. Certain things can stimulate muscle protein breakdown, such as illness or injury, malnutrition, or inactivity. These increase muscle protein breakdown, leading to a net negative balance and an increase in muscle loss. On the other hand, Muscle protein synthesis is stimulated by exercise, hormones, or nutrition. We today will be talking specifically about protein and its stimulus on muscle protein synthesis and resulting muscle growth. In our adult population, we're honestly not usually trying to massively increase muscle size. We're really just trying to maintain muscle mass by making sure that we're optimally stimulating muscle protein synthesis to keep this balance at net neutral. So today, when we're talking about optimizing protein intake for older adults, we're going to focus on four areas. First, we're going to talk about the amount of protein necessary. Next, we'll touch on the differences in the types of protein. Then we'll talk about the sensitivity of, to a protein stimulus with age. And finally, we're going to talk about the timing of protein consumption throughout the day. So first, the amount of protein. What are the recommendations for protein intake for older adults? Let's step back a second and talk about dietary reference intakes in general, or DRIs. DRIs are nutrient-based reference values. These estimate the amount of nutrients required to prevent deficiencies in healthy individuals 
in a particular life stage or sex group. The estimated average requirement, or EAR, is the average daily nutrient intake level estimated to meet the requirement of half of healthy individuals. It's circled here in red. The recommended dietary allowance, or RDA, is what you're more, probably more familiar with, and it's in green. It's the average daily dietary intake level that's sufficient to meet the nutrient requirements for nearly all, about 97 or 98 percent, of healthy individuals. An adequate intake, or AI, is set instead of an RDA if sufficient scientific evidence is not available to calculate an EAR, or RDA. The tolerable upper intake level, or UL, here in blue, is the highest average daily nutrient intake level that's likely to pose no adverse health effects. And intakes above this UL increases the risk for adverse events. Finally, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, or AMDR, is the range of intake for a particular energy source that provides intakes of essential amino nutrients or acids at adequate levels. So what do our guidelines say? The EAR for protein is 0.66 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. The RDA, which is what most of you are probably more familiar with, is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. There's no tolerable upper intake level for protein that has been set. Finally, the AMDR for protein um, is between 10 and 35 percent of the daily energy to be consumed from protein sources. It's important to note that the recommendations for protein are the same for all adults over the age of 18. There are no additional recommendations for older adults over 65. So it's important to remember that DRIs estimate the amount of nutrients required to prevent a deficiency in healthy individuals. So the recommendations are not set to promote optimal health, just really to prevent a deficiency. Experts in the field have published numerous consensus reports over the years indicating that higher levels of protein are needed for healthy older adults, as compared to young adults, to promote optimal health. Their recommendations are that older adults should consume between 1 and 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, and that those with illness or sarcopenia may need even higher levels of protein in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. So what research backs up these recommendations for older adults to increase their protein consumption as compared to younger adults? In the study presented here, dietary protein intake was assessed by using an interview administered 108 item food frequency questionnaire. It was done in men and women um, aged about 70 to 79 years old. And these um, participants were in the health, aging, and body composition health ABC study. Changes in lean mass and appendicular lean mass over a three-year period were measured using DEXA. The association between protein intake and three-year changes in lean mass and appendicular lean mass was examined using multi multiple linear regression analysis, and they adjusted for potential confounders. And I know many of you are looking at this slide and thinking about all the discussions about possible issues with the quintiles in this graph, because there's a bit of a lack of difference between quintile one and quintile three. However, I want you to take the big takeaway from this to be that after adjustment for potential confounders, energy-adjusted protein intake was found to be associated with three-year changes in lean mass. And participants in the highest quintile of protein intake lost approximately 40% less lean mass and appendicular lean mass than those in the lowest quintile of protein intake. And the ability to maintain 40% more mass over a three-year period is a critical finding. Those in the highest quintile were consuming, on average, about 1.1 gram per kilogram as compared to the 0.7 grams per kilogram in the lowest quintile. And this suggests that consuming higher amounts of protein may help maintain muscle mass and function in older adults. So we've discussed how much protein is recommended to prevent deficiencies, which were the RDA recommendations, and also how much protein was recommended to promote optimal health, which was more of those research findings. Next, we're going to discuss how much protein older adults are actually consuming. Although protein intakes in the United States are widely regarded as adequate, attention has been given recently to potential inadequacies of the recommendations or patterns of intakes in older adults. And in this study, data was obtained from adults aged 51 years and older in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, 2005-2006 cohort. 
for um, this talk, we're going to focus on the older adult group, which in this study was those that were aged over 71 years and older. If we first look at women, estimates of intakes of protein on average for women in this population was 0.85 grams per kilogram, which falls above the RDA. For men, we're also above the RDA for protein on average with 0.96 grams per kilogram. However, if we look to the right of this table at the percent of the population that's below the EAR, which I'll remind you, the EAR is the average daily nutrient intake level estimated to meet the requirements of only half of healthy individuals. Estimates for inadequate intakes ranged from 24% of women to 12% of men. And this is very concerning because if they're not even meeting the EAR, a higher percentage of men and women are not meeting the RDA as well and are at risk of being deficient for protein. And if we remember that research suggests that older adults consume between 1 and 1.2 grams of protein to promote optimal health, on average, our healthy older adults are well below the threshold for optimal protein recommendations. Here at UTMB, we have recently been examining diet patterns in community dwelling older adults after an acute hospitalization, and we found very similar evidence. Well, on a whole, older adults in our study are not consuming statistically significantly lower amounts of calories per day. About 60% of older adults are not meeting the caloric recommendation. So while some older adults are consuming almost double the recommendation, a huge percentage of these at-risk individuals are consuming well below their needed caloric intakes. And as expected, the majority are also not meeting the EAR or RDA for protein. The second area we're going to focus on to optimize protein intake to maintain muscle mass and function in older adults is differences in the types of protein. So does the protein source matter? So protein comes in two types. The first are deemed complete protein sources. And these proteins contain all the essential amino acids in the amounts that meet or exceed human requirements. Examples of um, complete proteins are almost all animal proteins, beef, poultry, pork, fish, eggs, uh, milk and milk products. These are some examples. Also, soy protein is a complete protein source. The second type um, of protein source is an incomplete protein source. And these proteins are too low in one or more of the essential amino acids necessary. They cannot serve as the sole source of protein in the diet and must be eaten with other complementary protein sources. Most plant proteins beans, rice, grains, legumes, other than soy, and vegetables are considered incomplete proteins. And an example of an incomplete protein that could be combined together in complement in a meal to meet all the requirements would be rice and beans or peanut butter and toast. The third thing we're going to talk about is how the sensitivity to a protein stimulus changes with age. And how does that affect our goal of optimizing protein intake to maintain muscle mass and function in older adults? So how much protein is actually needed to stimulate muscle protein synthesis in older adults? Anabolic resistance is a concept that's currently under some debate. However, I think this series of figures explains the concept quite elegantly. This study retrospectively analyzed data from muscle protein synthesis in healthy younger, and older men after ingestion of various amounts of high-quality dietary protein. Using biphase linear regression and breakpoint analysis, you can see that in younger men, as you move across the x-axis and um, we see men consuming more and more protein, muscle protein synthesis increases until you reach the breakpoint, which is right about 0.24 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And after this breakpoint, the line plateaus with increasing protein, there's no further increase in muscle protein synthesis. So if you were to consume this amount of protein, 0.24 grams of protein per kilogram, at three meals of the day, to maximally stimulate muscle growth and muscle protein synthesis at each meal, this would equal about 0.7 grams per kilogram per, uh, per day, which is right in line with our RDA. However, if we look at older adults, we can see that the breakpoint has shifted. This is anabolic resistance. It takes more protein in older adults to reach the same peak muscle protein synthesis. The breakpoint in older adults is about 0.4 grams per kilogram, which would equal spread out over those three meals 1.2 grams per kilogram a day. And this suggests that healthy older men are less sensitive to low protein intakes 
and require a greater relative protein intake in a single meal than young men to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And because we want to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis at each meal to make sure we stay in net balance, these values should be considered when developing nutritional solutions to maximize muscle protein synthesis for the maintenance and enhancement of muscle mass with advancing age. So finally, the last area we're going to focus on to optimize protein intake to maintain muscle mass and function in older adults is the timing of protein consumption throughout the day. We're going to discuss if the distribution of protein consumed is important and if a skewed or a spread diet pattern is better. So once again, this data comes from the NHANES 2005-2006 cohort. So if we again focus on the older adult population, those that are age 71 and above, we can see that in both men and women's diets, they tend to be skewed, with low levels of protein in the morning at breakfast and significantly higher, two to three times the amount later in the day at dinner. If we look at this graphically using the 2007-2008 NHANES data for all older adults, we can see just how skewed dietary consumption typically is in our older adults. And we can compare this reported distribution, which is typically eaten by older adults, to a more ideal distribution, which was modeled by Dr. Patton Jones and Rasmussen. And this spread meal pattern was designed to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis at each meal. And this would theoretically lead to a maintenance or increase in muscle mass. And this theoretical model of a spread or even versus skewed diet pattern was tested by Dr. Patton Jones in this seven-day crossover design study, which had a 30-day washout period. Young men and women were fed either a spread or skewed diet. They examined 24-hour muscle protein synthesis on days one and seven of the study. They found that muscle protein synthesis was 25% higher in the spread diet versus the skewed diet, indicating that consumption of a moderate amount of protein at each meal was more effective at maximally stimulating muscle protein synthesis than consuming smaller amounts with breakfast and lunch and a large amount at dinner. It's important to note that this study was done in young men and women. And remember with anabolic resistance, older adults are less sensitive to low protein intakes and require a greater relative dose of protein in a single meal to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So those small amounts of protein at breakfast and lunch may not maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis in older adults. So these differences in skewed versus spread could be even greater in older adults. And the importance of reaching the protein threshold for each meal to stimulate muscle protein synthesis is of even more importance to maintain muscle mass in older adults. OK, so to review, we focused on four areas to optimize protein intake to maintain muscle mass and function in older adults. First, we talked about the amount of protein necessary. The RDA recommends 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. However, research suggests that it's recommended for healthy older adults to consume higher amounts for optimal health. Next, we talked about the differences in the types of protein and the importance of consuming high quality, complete, or complementary protein sources. Then we discussed the sensitivity and importance of timing and the importance of consuming three meals with a moderate amount of protein at each meal to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So as we move on to the second half of this presentation, I'll focus more on the application and translation of the research that we've discussed in our older adults into a more clinical population. So first we're going to discuss some of the reasons that older adults have poor nutrition. And I'll provide some suggestions for the common challenges that older adults face. So the first challenge that we'll discuss is a decrease in senses. So as we age, a few things change in terms of our senses. Our appetite decreases, the ability to detect thirst declines, and the sense of smell and taste decreases, which leads to a less of enjoyment of a meal. There are some easy solutions that we can use to combat these declines. Overall, we want to make food more appealing for our older adults. We can encourage older adults to drink plenty of liquids, water, juice, milk, soup, and supplements or shakes. Liquids are oftentimes easier for older adults to drink. Um, it's often easier for older adults to drink food rather than to eat it. 
And as older adults are often on low-salt diets, encouraging the use of herbs, marinades, dressings, and sauces to increase flavor is very important. I mentioned the recent study we've been running here at UTMB, collecting diet patterns in acutely ill older adults. And from my experience in those post-hospitalized, community-dwelling older adults, we need not to focus on which type or source, beef versus dairy versus soy, of protein. We more need to focus on just increasing the amount of any type of protein and any type of calories in this population. The second challenge that um, older adults face in meeting their nutritional needs is poor oral health. Jaw pain, mouth sores, missing teeth, and ill-fitting dentures all make chewing more difficult and painful in this population. Thus, it's hard to eat healthy foods and hard to chew meat-based protein sources. So obviously, it's important to encourage regular dental care in this population. However, while oral surgery to remove teeth is often covered under Medicare, dentures are not. And in terms of chewing meat, slicing food more thinly may help. But here's a place where plant-based proteins are often easier for older adults to eat. And examples of soft plant-based proteins would include tofu or beans. Depression is also very common in older adults, but is not a part of normal aging. Depression has been shown to be associated with decreased appetite, which often leads to skipping of meals and unvaried food choices. Obviously, treatment for depression should be discussed with a doctor, but there are solutions for some of the challenges that come along with depression. Scheduling meals at the same time each day, even using a timer if necessary, has been shown to help with older adults who choose to or forget to miss, forget and miss meals. In addition, making eating a social event is an easy solution that's been shown to inc increase caloric consumption in our older adults. If older adults reduce their meal pattern down from three meals a day to two meals a day, which is actually quite common in our older adult population, they're missing out on one-third of the maximal stimulus for protein synthesis and muscle growth to maintain muscle mass. And they'll be at a much higher risk for increased net negative balance and muscle loss. Medication side effects can massively impact the nutritional status of older adults. Polypharmacy is a major issue in our older adult population. Many medications have negative effects on food consumption by causing food to taste differently, reducing appetite, and altering digestion and absorption of nutrients. Preliminary results from another study that we're running in older adults who are taking antibiotics looked at dietary intakes as measured by a 24-hour food recall collected early after discharge within the first week while they're still taking antibiotics and later in recovery after their antibi antibiotics have finished. And we have found that there's no difference between early and late recovery in patients that are not taking antibiotics. However, in our patient population that are taking antibiotics, dietary intake is much lower in that first week after discharge. And we think that this may be due to the side effects that older adults often face when taking antibiotics, nausea, diarrhea, et cetera, and specifically encouraging this subset of at-risk patients to increase their caloric intake and providing information on easily digestible protein sources may help in recovery. Many of the issues that we've recently discussed touched on financial challenges that older adults face due to being on a fixed or limited income. Oftentimes, older adults cut back on grocery expenses to pay for medications, doctor visits, dentist visits, etc. And they tend to then purchase cheaper, more highly processed, and less nutritious foods. The solution for this challenge really stems from education. While government assistance may be available for some older adults, education on nutrient-dense food choices will help older adults to choose better options. Older adults do not need to purchase an expensive piece of meat for dinner. Just because it's more expensive doesn't mean it's better. A, place of rice, a plate of rice and beans can also meet the requirements, or a proper serving size of fish, chicken, or beef can be another economic option. It's just important that a moderate amount of protein is eaten at each meal to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis to maintain muscle mass in this population. Physical limitations is the last challenge we'll discuss. As we age, our functional status decreases. Pain and poor strength makes cooking meals difficult. I already have issues opening jars occasionally, so it's to be expected that our older adults would have more challenge preparing meals, opening jars, opening cans, peeling or chopping vegetables, and standing for long periods of time. In addition, many older adults do not drive anymore, and transportation issues can be a major barrier. Once again, once we recognize the challenges, we can provide solutions. 
adaptive instruments and tools can be provided. Mobility aids may help provide a stool for older adults to sit on while preparing meals. Also, rides can be arranged so that older adults can go to the grocery store to physically pick out their groceries, which has been shown to encourage greater consumption and enjoyment of meals. So as you can see, older adults face a lot of challenges that younger or middle-aged adults do not face in meeting their nutrition needs. Older adults even have their own MyPlate, which recommends many of the same suggestions we've just discussed. In the upper right corner, it recommends drinking plenty of fluids, which will help with dehydration and are often easier for older adults to consume. In the middle, choosing brightly colored fruits and vegetables, which can be fresh, frozen, dried, or canned, and specifically choosing options that are convenient, affordable, and readily available, can help with preparation time. And finally, in the bottom right, eating a variety of protein food choices. So we've talked quite a lot in the last few slides about high-risk, acutely ill individuals or older adults that have low caloric intake, and a lot of the practical implications and suggestions of how to get some of these older adults to just eat more calories and to just eat more protein. But how much food do you actually have to eat to meet the recommendations? So I thought it would be helpful here at this point of the presentation to give an example. So if we use the recommendation of to promote optimal health in healthy older adults of 1.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight a day, and we use a 200 pound typical male, this would be about 90 grams of protein each day. And so if we take into account spreading this protein across the three main meals of the day to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis, we would arrive at about 30 grams of protein per meal. So what does 30 grams of protein per meal look like? Let's talk about some protein equivalents so we can build imaginary meals for the day. So some examples of typical things that are eaten at breakfast include um, eggs. One egg is about six grams of protein. Cooked oats is another common older adult breakfast option, and half a cup is three grams of protein. Milk and soy milk have very similar amounts of protein, seven to eight grams per cup. Yogurt is another common option, with low-fat yogurt having nine grams and Greek yogurt having almost double that at 15 grams per serving. So we can see how we could easily make a healthy breakfast that meets the 30 grams of protein needed. We could have two eggs with a slice of bacon, a side of toast, a small apple, and a glass of milk. That would be a very well-balanced breakfast. Or we could have granola cereal with yogurt and a side of fruit. And varying our breakfast will encourage um, consumption of more food. For lunch, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on toast would provide about 15 grams of protein. Other options for sandwiches would include chicken or tuna salad or even soup. On the side, we can add in some fruits and vegetables to meet the necessary requirements. Other options for lunch and dinner include most meats and fish. It's important to note the serving size here. Three ounces is 21 grams. Almonds or quinoa are great sides that can add in protein to the diet. And edamame is one of my favorite snacks. It's a fantastic source of protein, and it packs a punch with 11 grams in just half a cup. So to review this section, there are many unique challenges that older adults face with advancing age, but there are easy solutions to many of these challenges. The biggest hurdle is recognizing the issues, whether that be a financial issue in which we can encourage cheaper sources of high quality protein, or if it's due to a functional impairment in which we can encourage the use of aids or pre-cut meats and vegetables to aid in preparation. Once we recognize the hurdle, we can help older adults to make the leap to maintain their proper nutrition and protein consumption. Once again, I'm going to harp on the fact that we need to encourage our older adults to have a moderate amount of high quality protein, and we're recommending that they consume this at each meal. And for older adults, it's really important that we stress that this means three meals throughout the day, not two. Also encouraging a variety of protein in the diet. There are so many options of high quality proteins available. The difficulty really comes in remembering all these different protein types and options, convincing older adults to vary their diet and try new things, and alter the way they've been eating for so many years. Okay, so the final section of this talk today is on clinical considerations. And in this next section, I'm going to focus specifically on soy protein and why older adults may want to incorporate more soy into their diet. Now, many of you have noticed that this talk is co-sponsored by SANA, the Soy Foods Association of North America. 
However, I made these slides, and I hope that by the end of this section, I will have convinced you that in this specific population, older adults, there are many health benefits to incorporating soy foods into the diet. And I'm not recommending that soy becomes the primary and the only protein source that older adults consume. Just that there may be some reasons why older adults would choose to incorporate some soy into their daily diet. I'm going to focus on three areas, sarcopenia, metabolic syndrome, and kidney health. So first, let's talk about sarcopenia. We touched on sarcopenia earlier in this talk. It's the gradual loss of muscle mass with aging. This loss of muscle mass leads to a reduced muscle strength and reduced physical performance. Increased risk for falls, increased health-related expenses, increased morbidity and mortality. And sarcopenia is a major contributor to disability and mortality in older adults. Serious adverse muscle loss, however, doesn't follow a nice, slow decrease with age as it is depicted with this dotted line in the model. Due to a series of catabolic crises, like hospitalization or illness, injury or inactivity, throughout our life there are these short periods of massive muscle loss, followed by a brief period of recovery. These catabolic events lead to an overall net loss in muscle mass and increase the risk of disability earlier in life. And thus, research has focused on maximally stimulating muscle protein synthesis during that period of recovery after catabolic events to help um, slow the decline of sarcopenia, sarcopenic muscle loss. Recently, investigators from our lab here at UTMB with Dr. Rasmussen and Volpe completed an acute study examining the role of different protein supplements to stimulate muscle protein synthesis in healthy older adults. And in this acute study, ingestion of whey protein isolate and a soy dairy protein blend, which contained 25% whey, 25% soy, and 50% casein, similarly enhanced post-exercise mTORC1 signaling, hyperaminoacidemia, muscle protein synthesis, and attenuation of muscle protein breakdown. And thus, a soy dairy blend may be a useful nutritional strategy for maintaining muscle mass and function during aging while reducing the disability associated with sarcopenia. An additional benefit for older adults is that soy blends tend to be slightly cheaper than straight whey protein supplements. And in this acute study, we showed that they had very similar effects on stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So for a cheaper supplement, you may be able to receive the same benefit. In addition, I just completed recruitment for a clinical trial I'm working on with Dr. Volpe's group, in which we translated these acute findings from healthy older adults into a more clinical population that had just suffered from a catabolic event, acute hospitalization. In this study, we wanted to know how feasible it was to ask older adults to take a supplement for 30 days post-hospital discharge. In previous studies, we've had compliance rates with supplements in the 80 to 95 percent range in younger and older healthy adults. And we wanted to know if an older adult, our average older adult in our study was about 85, that had just been discharged home from a three to four day hospital stay, would be capable of remembering to take, able to prepare, and would actually consume a supplement twice a day. We were surprised and pleased to find that adherence to supplements was adequate and averaged about 75% in this population, with no statistical differences between those taking protein and those taking the isochloric placebo. Thus, Protein supplementation may be a feasible intervention strategy in acutely ill older adults following discharge from hospitalization. And further research is currently ongoing to examine the efficacy and effect size of these supplements on accelerating rec recovery of muscle mass and physical function in older adults after this catabolic event. The next clinical consideration I'm going to discuss is metabolic syndrome. In order to be classified as having metabolic syndrome, you must have at least three of the criteria listed here. Each criteria and its associated threshold for clinical diagnosis are listed to the left. They include abdominal obesity, plasma triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, blood pressure, and fasting glucose. And the thresholds um, for meeting that criteria are here in the center. Indicated to the right are some examples of human studies that provide evidence of a potential role for soy protein consumption as a part of a lifestyle intervention strategy. So for abdominal 
obesity. Consumption of soy protein has been shown to be useful in weight management programs. It's also been shown to be associated with lower tri triglycerides, maintaining HDL cholesterol levels, and reduction in blood pressure. Soy protein consumption is also associated with decreased incidence of diabetes in some populations. The cholesterol lowering effects of soy protein are very well established and are one reason of many why older adults may want to start incorporating more soy into their diets to meet their protein needs. So finally, I just want to talk about soy protein and kidney health. A fantastic review on this topic was recently published this May. Chronic kidney disease is a significant public health problem in the older adult population. And while low protein diets are generally recommended, maintaining adequate levels of protein intake is critical for health. Soy protein has been the most extensively studied plant-based protein in subjects with kidney disease and has demonstrated renal protective properties in a number of clinical studies. And while these clinical studies have very small ends, the data does suggest that soy improves renal function or attenuates the progression of chronic renal dysfunction. Soy protein has been shown to be safe to consume by subjects with compromised renal function, and it's been shown to have positive effects on lipid and blood glucose profiles, improved vascular function, and a reduction in inflammation. So to review. Incorporating soy foods into the diet of older adults may provide many health benefits that this population specifically cares about. As I said, I'm not encouraging older adults to only consume soy protein. I'm just encouraging them to incorporate it into a few meals each week. Supplement blends may be useful and a feasible strategy to accelerate recovery after a catabolic crisis and may slow the progression of sarcopenia. There are many potential benefits from incorporating soy protein into the diet specifically decreasing the risk factors for metabolic syndrome. They're effective for weight management, have been shown to lower triglycerides, maintain HDL cholesterol levels, reduce blood pressure, and decrease the incidence of diabetes in some populations. All positive things and reasons why older adults may want to incorporate soy into their diet. They're also safe for patients with chronic kidney disease and may offer some renal protection as well. So with that, I'm just about out of time. I'm going to leave you here with my disclosures. And I really want to thank you all for listening in. Um, I hope you learned something new about how we can address the challenges in providing protein to support nutrition and health needs in our older adult population. Thank you, Rachel. I want to thank you for a very informative and excellent talk. We have had a couple of questions start to roll in. And remember, if you have a question, you can go ahead and, and type that. And we'll, we will um, get started on just answering as many questions as we can. I'm going to, as the moderator, just take the priority and ask the first question. So you mentioned that there were nine essential amino acids. Yet yeah, I think some of us learned when we were in school that there was only eight. And in some sources, if you pick them up and read them, they say there's 10 essential amino acids, which also includes the amino acid arginine. I know that uh, these different numbers often confuse my students. So I was wondering if you could clarify this possible discrepancy for the listeners. Sure, not a problem. This is really a great question, and I can see why it can be confusing, because depending on what literature you're looking at, sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's many, as many as 10. Um, histidine is the one um, that is sometimes referred to as a semi-essential amino acid, because adults can generally um, produce it in adequate amounts, however children cannot. And so that's really usually the difference between eight and nine is histidine. Um, arginine is the one that's usually added on to go from 9 to 10, and arginine is um, also considered semi-essential or conditionally essential. Um, and the body can usually produce enough of arginine for its needs. However, because it's used in so many metabolic versatile ways, the bioavailability of this protein is extremely important. Um, and so depending on the bioavailability of it, sometimes it is an essential amino acid, and that's why it's considered a conditionally essential amino acid. Did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Uh, we had another good question come in. The recommendation to spread protein out throughout the day and eat um, so much at every meal, based on the work of doctors 
Patton Jones and Rasmutin and also others, it does make sense, but is it 30 grams for everyone? So would a 120-pound older woman need the same amount as a 200 or 250-pound man? This is also a great question. Um, so research has been done in healthy older adults, and the recommendations are really to, con to consume between 20 and 30 grams to meet that anabolic threshold that we had talked about. And that 30-30-30 spread diet from Dr. Patton-Jones, um, which was you know, developed to meet those thresholds, um, has been well advertised in the media. And so a lot of people just know that 30-30-30. But yes, less protein is obviously needed for a lower body weight. And remember that the recommendations are all in grams per kilogram, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So obviously a 120-pound woman would need less. Um, so if we divide 120 pounds by 2.2 kilograms, we'd get about 55. Um, and so at the recommended 1.0 grams per kilogram, she'd need about 55 grams of protein per day. So then if we divide that by three, we get about 18 grams of protein per meal. Um, and so this falls a little short of the protein recommendations of 20 to 30 to meet that anabolic threshold. So I would probably encourage her to make sure that she's meeting or slightly exceeding that 18 grams of protein per meal to make sure that she's reaching that protein threshold, especially if she has any illness or comorbidities going on. Um, and so once again, it's really not difficult to meet that 18 grams of protein per meal. However, we just really want to make sure that we're eating foods that are you know, high quality protein sources. And so just having tea and toast in the morning is not going to do it. You're not going to reach reach your 18 grams of protein in the morning with having a slice of toast and some tea. So we really need to add in egg or yogurt um, and encourage uh, consumption of protein in that morning meal. Thank you. I guess just even for simplicity's sake, the 18 grams, you know, if we rounded it up, it would be, it would be 20. Yes. <laughs> one nice round number. Yes. Um, the next question. Um, I noticed that you did not have smoothies listed as a possible way to increase protein intake in an older person with decreased appetite. It would, of course, be very easy to blend soy protein in many forms, such as soft tofu or isolated soy protein with fruit, some juice, and even greens into a smoothie. I wonder if there are recipes available for smoothies or a quick ways to get to incorporate soy into the older person's diet. Sure. So um, smoothies are an easy and really tasty way to increase pro protein consumption in older adults. And remember I said a lot of older adults, um, it's easier to consume, uh, to drink your food than to eat it. Um, there are two ways to incorporate protein into a smoothie. You can use supplement powders, um, which is probably the way that most of us younger adults um, would incorporate protein in by using, you know, maybe a whey protein or a soy protein, pea protein. Um, you could add just, you know, some of that into a smoothie. Or you can also do it with whole foods, which is more similar to how you were suggesting. Um, there are quite a few foods that are high in protein that could be added to smoothies easily. Um, you mentioned soft tofu, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, um, seeds or nuts, uh, peanut butter or soy butter, um, oats or oatmeal. Um, they can all be added in to really increase the protein in, um, in that drink. And then obviously you're going to flavor it with some sort of fruits or veggies to add more nutrients and protein. And to add some more liquid using milk, um, dairy, soy, almond, coconut milk, um, these are often used to add liquid into the smoothie and what would add additional protein. So you can really see how much just that, you know, glass of a smoothie could really pack a punch and you could get quite a bit of protein in. It would also be a great way to add um, protein into a breakfast um, is just to have a side smoothie. Um, so my favorite smoothie for breakfast is Greek yogurt, banana, orange, juice, and strawberries. Um, I always have frozen strawberries in the freezer. So this is a quick, easy way um, to add a breakfast smoothie in. Um, I know that a lot of the um, supplement websites um, have smoothie um, recommendations, and I know that the Santa website has some um, smoothie recipes on it as well. So perhaps on our blog post, we could post a few um, sample recipes for smoothies for older adults that would um, help encourage uh, increasing the protein. 
Great, thank you. So I believe we are getting close to being out of time for questions, trying to keep this webinar um, well under an hour. Um, but I want to thank you, Rachel, for such a great presentation again. And on behalf of ACSM and the Soy Foods Association of North America, I want to thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar. And I'm going to turn it back over to Nate to wrap things up. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, and like Dr. Larson Meyer mentioned earlier, um, we will be able to get to a good number of questions that were submitted through the GoToWebinar question block uh, via a blog post that we'll post on the ACSM certification uh, website within the next two or three weeks. Uh, so we appreciate your questions and we'll be sure to get to those. Um, one last reminder for those that are on the live webinar, um, one continuing education credit will be emailed to you within the next three or four days. So look for something by early next week at the latest. And also uh, I had a couple questions about uh, receiving the PDF copy of the slides. Um, we should be able to do that as well. I will get the slides uh, from Rachel and uh, we will send that link to you along with the recorded version and the CEC. Uh, so look for that again early next week. And again, on behalf of uh, Soy Foods Association and ACSM, thank you very much for attending and have a great day.